Sam was referred to our program because he was having a very, very hard time in preschool. His behavior was aggressive every day toward children and toward teachers. And his teacher told me when he called to make the referral that Sam literally could not go from the gate where his mother dropped him off to the door of the preschool without knocking down at least one child every day without fail. And so one of the early things I did in my work with the family was get permission from Elizabeth and from the teacher to go to school with Sam and hang out with him and see what was happening and see if I could understand what was going on. So one morning, very early in our work together, I met Sam at the gate when his mother dropped him off. And I walked across the yard with him um, and I went into the school with him and I spent the morning. But the most interesting thing happened on our trip across the yard. We were walking along and Sam didn't know me very well at the time, but I'd, I'd, I'd been with him a few times. And so, you know, I'd, I'd been with him with his mom. He, he knew that he, you know, that I was okay with her. Um, he didn't have any, uh, any trouble coming up to me, going, walking with me across the yard. And so we were walking and talking a little bit. And I was looking down at him and I noticed that his hands had formed into fists. So I reached down and I touched his hand and I said, what's gonna happen? And he pointed across the yard to a child who was walking toward us and said, that, that kid's going to hit me. And I thought, well, maybe, I don't know. You know, I don't know that child. So I told Sam, listen, I'm bigger than anyone on this ground except your teacher. I'm not going to let anyone hit you. I'm bigger than that kid. I'm going to protect you. I'm not going to let anyone hit you. Let's just, let's just keep going and see what happens. So we started to walk again. And we were chatting, and pretty soon I noticed Sam's hands clenching into fists and his arms coming up, and the little boy is coming closer and closer to us. And I said again, relax, I'm not going to let anyone hit you. And the child walked right by us to a child who was behind us on the playground with whom he intended to play and with whom he began to play. And he didn't even look at us. We were totally not on his radar. But Sam's attention biased a threat in the real world was such that every approach seemed dangerous to him. Every approach led to the possibility that he would be hurt. That was what his internal working model told him happened between people. They hurt each other. Um, uh, and I get to welcome Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, clinician, researcher, and teacher in the area of post-traumatic stress. His work integrates developmental, neurobiological, psychodynamic, and interpersonal aspects of the impact of trauma and its treatment. He is president of the Trauma Center and Trauma Research Foundation in Boston, Massachusetts, past president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, and professor of psychiatry at Boston University Medical School. He regular, regularly teaches at universities and hospitals around, around the world. He is also the author of the 2014 New York Times bestseller, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Treatment of Trauma, which I know that many of you in the audience have read. In the book, he shows how these areas can be reactivated through innovative treatments, including neurofeedback, mindfulness techniques, play, yoga, and other therapies. No less importantly, Dr. Van der Kolk was Patricia's colleague and friend, and we are delighted and honored to have you here today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. That's quite a big deal. Uh, I knew Patricia, I'm particularly close to her friend, uh, Alicia Lieberman, and we have been great supporters of each other's work for all these years. It's also an honor to be invited to Israel. Uh, it's always interesting that people look to America to give you advice on how to treat people. We're not doing so well over there, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, we have some troubles. We are no longer the city of the hill that, from which nothing but good things come forward. But indeed, the field of traumatic stress, to some degree, did come from us, strangely enough. And it's particularly fertile in Boston, Massachusetts, of all places, 
uh, somehow in the in the 70s we got together and we did something that academics rarely do uh, particularly Judy Herman and myself and we decided to not mess with each other not compete with each other we decided to actually support each other even though we came from very different fields and for the first 15 years of this field it's an extremely collaborative field uh, where people really share things closely together I hope you guys in this wonderful complex of buildings will achieve the same thing that rather than competing with each other you'll put your resources together one of the things that emerged very early on is that uh, we put this diagnosis of PTSD together because we were working with soldiers and very quickly we re realized that there was another group of traumatized people who were quite different in some ways from soldiers and rape victims and these were people who uh, were traumatized by their own caregivers as children and it is very clear that the greatest source of danger for children is their own parents and the greatest for danger for women is their own intimate partners and somehow this issue of attachment has never been officially uh, integrated in the issue of trauma and what I also hear people say is that the relationship is everything and I wish that were true because then love could cure all and it doesn't really so uh, some years ago I went to the museum in Oslo of Munch and we all know that picture and when you go to the museum there's some interesting pictures there that maybe illustrate why Munch despite of all of his honors and how deeply loved he was never really did very well and was always a very unhappy person when he was four years old his mother died of tuberculosis when he was six years old his sister died of tuberculosis leaving home home alone to be taken care of his dad and he never really recovered from the pain of the loss of his primary caregiver and so the issue of loss and grief and caregiving all sort of fits together and continues to be not very well studied so the way that we started to study it is that Judy Herman and I got together at some point I've always been very interested in neurobiology in the brain uh, Judy was very much a feminist person and we started to talk to each other how it appeared like most patients who we had who carried the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder um, had childhood histories of trauma and we looked in the literature and nobody had ever said that and we talked about it to our colleagues and they said oh haven't you read Otto Kernberg it's and Melanie Klein it's all about a genetic inclination to bite the breast and to aggress against the source that feeds you has nothing to do with reality and we said could be let's find out so we happen to have a database of every single person in the Cambridge Hospital one of the Harvard teaching hospitals um, that has very good therapy and we got a hold of all those records and uh, people had asked all the right questions except that they had forgotten to ask about childhood trauma and attachment patterns because that seemed to be irrelevant in how people turn out to be and so Judy and I started to think about how do you actually take a trauma history and we very quickly realized uh, we're not stupid uh, that you cannot go up to somebody and say were you ever raped the only reasonable answer to that is go to hell it's none of your business uh, so you need to really go there gently and my favorite saying there is W.H. Auden has a poem that says truth like love and sleep resents approaches that are too intense and so Judy and I put a questionnaire together we called the traumatic antecedents questionnaire that we still use at the trauma center for our intake forms and we asked people we have an interview with people we know nothing else about um, where do you live who do you live with who does the cooking who does the cleaning who does the shopping who pay the bills 
very simple things. Some people gave us very strange answers, but we are researchers, we just noticed things. Um, when you're in trouble, who do you rely on for practical help? When you're in trouble, who do you go to, who you can you talk to? Quite a few people said, my cat, my dog, sometimes my therapist. But it's not so great if your therapist is the only person you can talk to. Um, and then we asked people, how about when you were little? Who did the cooking? Who did the cleaning? Who made the bed? Who did the shopping? Uh, who was there for you when you came home from school? And we started to get really interesting answers. And then we started to ask the real nasty questions. We said, was there anybody who recognized you as a special person? And then we asked the killer question, which I, to my knowledge, nobody had ever asked before. Was there anybody you felt safe with growing up? And one out of three patients in the psychiatric hospitals said, I do not remember feeling safe with anybody growing up. And that is a very big deal. And that continues to be a very big deal here. Then we asked a bunch of other questions. Here's another one of my favorite ones, also for us to think about. Who made the rules and enforced the discipline at home? What were the rules like in your family? How did you, were the kids disciplined with hitting, spanking, verbal abuse, hitting with an object? How did your parents solve their disagreements? Parents think very question. How did your parents solve your, their disagreements? How do you solve your disagreements with your spouse? Do you hit each other? Do you run out of the house? Do you disappear? Do you write letters? Do you break things? Do you jump out of the window? And by the times we have asked all of these detailed questions, people are curious about themselves and we get the stories. And now we put it all together in a little thing. And it turns out that 87% of all people who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder had serious histories of early childhood abuse and or neglect, starting before age seven. When this paper gets quoted, people always leave out the starting before age seven. But that's a very important thing because there is such a thing as critical periods of brain development um, that determine how your brain matures. I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Um, other personality disorders were not related to childhood trauma. So there's a study number one. But it's another study that came out of this, which actually was much closer to my heart. And that is that I w I've always been in intrigued with self mutilation. People who burn themselves with cigarettes and say, I'm feeling so much better now. Or when I cut myself at various parts of my body, I actually feel better. I've never tried it myself, but I don't think that would work for me. And so I think these people have a different biology. And how do people get these different biologies? And I've always hang out with neuroscientists like Jacques Panksepp and people like that who study these things in young animals and they tell us what happens in the brain that might be responsible for that in terms of opioid receptors and stuff like that. And so we do this study of who in the hospital is doing self-destructive behavior. And it turns out that suicide attempts are highly related to childhood histories of sexual abuse, childhood histories of physical abuse, abandonment and neglect, cutting, sexual abuse, abandonment, physical abuse, eating disorders, not quite as one-to-one, -one, but high correlations. And then the interesting study came. It's very relevant to the work that we do today. And that is that this is, was a very, is a very good hospital. To this day, it's still a very good hospital. And people got trained to be very good psychotherapists. And so we had a chance to look at what happened to these patients and who got better in psychotherapy and who did not get better. So what you're about to see is the sample of patients who did not improve with very good psychotherapy. And the people who did not get better were the people said, who said, I cannot remember feeling safe with anybody growing up. I cannot remember being a special person. And so what showed up is a finding it's actually quite important for psychotherapists is that if people don't drink the milk of human kindness when they're small, the receptors for milk of human kindness may not develop. 
and maybe psychotherapy based on the relationship may not be by, by all that useful. Uh, that's a hard thing for us as psychotherapists to, uh, to actually embrace, or therapists that I know refuse to actually pay attention to these data, and they always say the relationship will make people better. And people continue to believe that until they adopt kids out of orphanages. And then they think um, these kids who didn't get love out there in Russia or Vietnam or, or China, when they come to live with us, I don't know if that happens in, in Israel, it happens a lot in our neighborhood in Boston. Um, that these kids don't respond to the milk of human kindness. And a very large part of our population are kids whose foster parents, adoptive parents, are desperate because these kids do not respond to love and kindness and live in their own little world. Uh, so how do you deal with people who do not respond to the milk of human kindness? And I'll start with an anecdote here. An anecdote is we had uh, somebody, uh, the other interesting part about our neighborhood is the most highly educated neighborhood in all of North America. Um, it also has a lot of gay couples. Massachusetts was the first state in America that legalized gay marriage. One of the si side effects of legalizing gay marriage, I never expected that because I'm not gay, and it turned out to be that gay couples who love each other would like to have a family. And then they start adopting children to have a family together. It does not And it turns out that a lot of these very loving couples got kids. And the kids were very off the wall. They were so temper tantrums. They did not respond to kindness. They did not respond to limits. They did very badly. And so at one point, we get uh, a couple brings a kid to us, a four-year-old kid adopted from China a year and a half before, who has been mute ever since. And they bring it to us, the famous trauma center. They say, can you help us? And we say, of course we can. We're at the trauma center, we can do anything. And we get to work, and three months later, this kid is as mute as it's ever been. And the good thing about outfits, I hope you have it too, they have team meetings. They have team meetings, somewhat to discuss our successes, but mainly discuss, to discuss our failures because you learn so much more from failures than from successes. It's better for your ego, but this is science, and we're trying to figure things out. And so we present the case, and one of our group members says, you know, it, this is not working, but there's this group across town. Um, uh, they do sensory integration with kids, and these kids walk on balance beams, and sit on swings and lie under heavy blankets and they lie in baths with a lot of balls on top of them, all sensory input and sensory integration. Let's give it a try. And we send this kid over there and after a few weeks they start talking. And we say, that's interesting. There's something there. Um, and then Liz, Liz Warner, who's a member of our staff, oh no, disappear. Don't buy the latest Apple. <coughs> they make your slides go into the cloud, never to be found again. So this is Liz. Um, now my sound is not working. Whew, boy. I just 
checked up before we started. Okay, so Liz is a psychologist who used to work with, uh, with um, autistic kids and she says, this is really interesting, Shit, let's set up a sensory integration lab at the trauma center. So, as you can see, we're a very wealthy clinic with very fancy equipment. And one of the things that we discover is that if you get a little trampoline, that kids, we, we analyze these videotapes. And when you, kids jump up and down a trampoline, something changes in the perception of time. And before the these kids are really screwed up and they're just filled with emotion or being shut down. And when they start jumping, the sense of time comes online. For me as a neuroscientist, very interesting because the sense of balance here is in your cerebellar vestibular area of the brain. And yes, the talking center in of your brain is in the left anterior prefrontal lobe. So by changing the balancing system in the brain, you activate a different part of your brain. Uh, so when kids start, uh, so here's the equipment that we all should get, a little trampolines. He talks about tomorrow. Uh, and I'm a very body-oriented person. I really have the time to talk about stuff. I would talk about the body. And also about synchrony. And it is interesting that when I talk a lot to, to groups like this, how you don't notice it about yourself, but you're a little bit like a shoal of fish. When one person moves, another person moves. When you move, you see people move very subtly. It's very rare to see an audience like this, somebody make movements that are out of sync with anybody else. It's very striking. Traumatized people tend to make movements that are physically out of sync with their environment. That means a lot. I could talk a lot about airborne. And so what I see here is that this kid's mom comes out of the corner and moves in a way that's really not in sync with how this boy and Liz are talking. So this is a very traumatized boy, very messed up kid, a very behaviorally controlled kid. And we still have a trauma focus. And we think, oh, who put what into what orifice? Who beat this kid up? What happened to this kid? Because sadly, that's how people think about trauma. And as you'll see, it's something very different. So mom comes out of the corner, making a movement that's out of sync with the rest. And then she says something that again is out of sync with whatever else is happening. And being human means being in sync. Being a very well-functioning person means you're in sync with your surroundings. Anybody saw and was alarmed by what you just saw? Uh, this is the diagnosis, a real diagnosis. Huh? This means that in our family, only one person gets to talk at a time, and there's no room for anybody else. And so you can look at the trauma to you deep in the face, but as I'll show you in the course of my lecture, it is usually not what the trauma is, but who was in sync with you and who was there for you. That's the primary thing. This kid is suicidal. If whenever some, I threw a ball at somebody or opened my mouth and tried to say something, people would completely ignore me. I'd want to kill myself also. Yeah? So maybe that's what it's all about. Not being seen, not being paid attention to, not being resonated with. So everybody's completely out of tune with everybody, and that is the pathology of this family. And so then Liz, spend some time really getting them to deal with what to mind, mind is the most important um, piece of equipment in doing psychotherapy 
It's called the beach ball. Huh? The beach ball is a wonderful thing. You should all get one. And you can toss things back and forth and get in sync with each other. And one of the great things that you will see when you get in sync with each other, you cannot help but giggle. And giggling is actually a very important human activity which never gets mentioned in any textbook of social work or psychotherapy except for mine. And so you just heard the first meaningful sound in this whole movie. <laughs> the sound of pleasure. And the word pleasure gets continuously ignored in our field, but life, as people in Tel Aviv know, is about pleasure. <laughs> and of, Ma, of course, Mama was a terribly traumatized kid himself who has never been in tune and in touch with anybody. And she just gets a deep sense of joy of finally being in sync with her kid and with Liz. And so that slowly evolves into our SMART program, our sensory integration program, one of the core programs of the trauma center, um, where we help traumatized people to get in sync with each other and in tune with each other. And for the past 30 years, I've run an annual co conference in Boston. And this year, there will be many uh, presentations on attachment by people like Atronic and Beatrice Bibi. But there will be also be a very big component on sensory integration. So if you want to come to Boston to really put your, put your teeth into really these motoric synchronous actions that can actually help people to get it together, it's very important. This is very much bolstered by a piece of work that my colleague um, Louise Lanius and her student Shivane Harazarian were doing. Uh, in that, you know, we're also doing your science stuff and brain stuff, and what keeps showing up in the brain is the cerebellum. And what keeps showing up abnormalities in the vestibular system. And everybody's always dismissing that because psychotherapists are into talking and making meaning. It turns out that early childhood trauma leads to major deficits in the sensory integration areas of the brain, which Beth Hornick, who follows me, will talk about a little bit also. And that if we really want to help children and grown-up children with trauma, we need to actually pay attention to sensory integration. And what we see is we start pay, if we start paying attention to this balancing system and this core regulatory system in the back of the brain, the front of the brain changes. I hope to end up with that because the findings are really quite interesting. So, um, so. One thing that is very important for us with traumatized people is to do sensory integration. Uh, we have various options, body work, movement, touch, drumming, music, martial arts, and neurofeedback, all things that none of you learn in school as being helpful techniques, and oftentimes things that are derided as not being respectable treatments. But that's the treatment you need to do in order for things to work. The reason that I'm here is because Alicia Lieberman said those people in Jerusalem need to hear about a body, the important thing about working with the body in order for kids to recover from trauma. So here's another tape. I hope this works better. Yeah, it does. Um, this is a tape from uh, uh, the lab of my good friend Atronic, who lives down the street from me. And Atronic has done a very simple thing with his life, I hope. Our life was as simple as that. He studied a very simple thing called the still-faced technique. What he does, he sits in a lab, he has a mom and a baby play, moms with various backgrounds, drug-addicted mom, mom, moms who take cocaine, traumatized moms. Um, he looks at the interaction between these moms and their babies. And what he then does at a certain moment is he asks the mom to freeze her face so that the interaction the music between mom and baby stops and the kid is left for himself. The main reason why I'd like to show this tape is not so much for you to pay attention to what happens on the screen, but most of all to pay attention to your 
internal sensations. This is really my way of inviting people to pay attention to their mirror neuron system, which is, of course, the critical system that we need as psychotherapists to pick up the sensations that the people we are with um, uh, are experiencing. And oftentimes, our bodies are much better in picking up what's really going on with their patients than our minds is, because our mirror neuron system is an exquisitely sensitive system that allows us to be sensorily in tune with each other. I said, now, if you have a bug in your ear, it's just told, don't respond to your kid. He says, Mommy, it's me. Does anybody feel anything in your body? Please raise your hand, sir. All but the most heartless people in this room <laughs> have a mirror neuron system that responds to this. And you feel what that little boy is feeling. Yeah? Your mirror neuron system is mirroring the sensations of the body. boy. Two minutes are up. Nothing happened. Uh, you hope that's the worst thing that will, ha will ever happen to this boy. And in fact, you can make a very good case that this is a very good thing for this boy. Anybody who deals with little kids knows how little kids get very distressed on a regular basis. And he gets distressed, and he knows that before too long, his mom will be there for them. Very good for you, the development of your limbic system that has a map of what to expect in the brain. And his brain is, I will become really distressed, and sooner or later, mom will be there for me and make me feel better. And that makes for object constancy. As the kids whose parents don't respond, don't develop that, if trouble with object constancy, are more likely to develop 
borderline personality disorder where they don't know that you can feel really upset, which most of us do from time to time, but that it will come to an end. And it doesn't mean that this event has no impact. Six months later, this little boy goes to visit his mom, who's a postdoctoral student in Tronic's lab, and they hook him up to a little cannula, and as he enters in this room, there's a little blip in his serum cortisol. So there is something in the back of his brain, it's no cognition whatsoever, it's just an automatic animal-like reaction that says, this is not a nice place. And he'll say, I'd rather be in that room. And the psychotherapist will say, why do you prefer that room over that room? And the kid will make it up an explanation because human beings make an explanation for everything. I don't think there's ever been a tribe in the world that when they asked him, why did the sun rise in the east and set in the west, that they say, I don't know. People make up an explanation for everything, including particularly psychologists, and most of our explanations are wrong. Hundred years from now ago, we will, from now we will laugh at the explanations we have today, but we are meaning-making people. We have to make meaning out of things. But you do have a little imprint on your body. And so what you see in this tape is the importance of that rhythmical relationship. And that particular rhythmical relationship was very carefully studied by Cole Winter Varthen. speed it up. This is about a mother and an infant talking to each other. And so maybe when we, we do our psychotherapy training, what we should train people in is voices and faces, because that's how we communicate with each other. And I don't do verbal psychotherapy, because I don't believe a word what my students will tell me, because we're incapable of accurately reporting on our own and other people's behavior. You need to see it. You need to see people's tone of voice. You need to see how people move their bodies together. You need to see what people's faces look like when they talk to each other. The voice, the, what, what people say is sort of the, almost maybe the least important or maybe not the important things. Um, so how, how do kids process traumatic experiences? Um, the first study on that, as far as I know, was done by Anna Freud and her friend Dorothy Burlingame. Anybody knows their studies? Okay, not enough to ignore it. And so they were done in 1946, 1947 in London uh, because during the Second World War, the Nazis were bombing London, were causing an enormous devastation, killed hundreds of thousands of people. And these nice Londoners said, um, this is very traumatic for our kids, that ship are all the kids that began off to the countryside to be safe and live in bucolic surroundings. And when the war is over, they'll come back home and they'll just be fine. Oliver Sacks was one of those people. Anybody here is an Oliver Sacks fan? Anybody read Oliver Sacks' autobiography? Remember what he says. The second most traumatic event in his life was being shipped off to the countryside. The most traumatic event 
is when he told his mom that he was gay. And his mom said, I curse the day that you were born. Don't do that to your kill children because you will never be able to take that back. Okay, be very careful what you say. So Oliver Sacks was one of these people and it was very traumatic. And so uh, Freud and Berlin came, did these studies on these kids who had, were on the safe surroundings and these kids who stayed in London were just fine. And the kids who were separated from their caregivers were really messed up and depressed. So the, the attachment issue trumps the trauma issue. Not in the DSM, but in, not in psychiatry, but in real life it does. So here's an example. This little boy, now a grown up boy, is called Noam Sol. He happens to be the son of some people you know in this room, Esther Perel's son um, and Jack Sol. And uh, Noam was five and a half years old when he started first grade in PS 234 in Manhattan, uh, a school that's right underneath the World Trade Center. And so on September 11th, he goes to school at quarter to nine in the morning. His dad, Jack, drops, drops him off. And seven minutes later, he witnesses this from his classroom, only closer by than what we see here. His dad runs back and they become 50,000, two out of 50,000 people who start running down 7th Avenue, running away from the disaster. What's interesting to me is when I show this movie to psychotherapists and I say, what do you see here? The response almost invariably is, I see very scared people. I see panicked people. Because your training and education warps your perceptions, all of us. What you see here is people running. But because running is not an important part of how we think about trauma or the mind, we ignore the running piece. As those of you who were here yesterday heard me talk about quite a bit, probably at the core of trauma is physical immobility. The inability to do anything and to move away and activate your fight flight response talked a lot about yesterday, but the issue of being able to take action and to do something is probably the single most important protector against becoming traumatized in response to a terrible event. Uh, that's not part of our discipline and something that I and some of my colleagues are highly acti uh, very, very interested in bringing back into this world. It's a long story, but just like let me make it very short. Uh, we have all these meetings to talk about things, and uh, in one of our meetings, one of my colleagues shows this particular picture of the Brooklyn Bridge. And they say, that's interesting. So when people are under stress, they start running, and they start running in a particular direction. They don't start running randomly. I bet there was nobody from New Jersey on the Brooklyn Bridge that day, because New Jersey is over there. Huh? So when people are under stress, their bodies start moving to a particular place. Bolby talked about it already. We have a GPS, Bolby didn't know about the GPS part, um, in our brain that says when we are under stress, our bodies want to go home because home is safe. You had Claude Chemtop here a few years ago, uh, and Claude Chemtop did a research in New York of who got traumatized, it turned out almost nobody in New York got traumatized except the people who were married to uh, mentally ill, traumatized, domestic violence type situations. So as long as when home was not safe, people got traumatized. And so as long as you can move, and as long as you have a safe place to come home to, you are probably going to be okay. Um, that's true for children, that's true for adults. And then as all this is going on with all this work, I have a flashback to the last page of my anatomy textbook in medical school, which is something you probably also have frequently here in this scholarly work that you live in. Um, so this is the last page of Neto's textbook of anatomy. You say, he really nailed it. And when you get traumatized, your body gets activated to flee, to fight, and to get away with something. 
and what our research has shown, which I talked about yesterday, now, is that when you get traumatized, your frontal lobe uh, shuts down and you take leave of your senses. Nobody is rational when you feel under threat. Bad thing for you. A place like this where people are always under stress because it makes it harder for you to be rational because you always feel threatened. Um, and your limbic system takes over. And when your limbic system takes over, it just makes your body move. And so my definition of traumatic stress is when the body gets stuck in the limbic mode of fear and terror. And so maybe the, uh, the, the first thing you do with traumatized people is to make their bodies feel safe. And how do you make their bodies feel safe? By reuniting them with people who they love, people who hold them, um, doing things like yoga, and other things that make their bodies feel safe. And it's not a cognitive issue, it's a body issue, and the body needs to feel safe. And as I talked about yesterday, it's oftentimes extremely difficult to make the bodies of traumatized kids and adults feel safe and calm. And that becomes the great challenge. And the slide I got from Stephen Porges. Well, I, of course, I did in the cold blood, you idiot, I'm a reptile. We all become reptiles when we are under threat. So this is a picture I took in New York. And so after a disaster, I'm sure it happens in Israel also, people tend to pull very close together. People tend to become very nice to each other after a disaster because evolutionarily we know that we need to be good to people who are traumatized but if, because if we don't, they'll bite us in the ass because they will stay in their trauma and become aggressive and mean. And so most societies become very calm and safe and of course not always and it has terrible disasters. And I think that's probably the sort of kids that, that you treat here is kids who cannot be helped to be feel, feel safe after terrible things happen because I, their parents are too traumatized, disrupted, mentally ill or disorganized to actually provide that sense of safety for them and that means that you have to do it. So um, the story here is that uh, Esther Perel and Jack, her husband, and I walked through the pit of the World Trade Center on September 13th. They knew some of the people cleaning up there and we come back home around nine o'clock in the evening and Noam shows me this picture. And I say to Noam, Noam, can I have that picture? That is an amazing picture. And he says, no. And I say, well, you know, I'm writing a book and I really want this picture to be in my book. And so, will you give it to me? He said, no. He said, I'll sell it to you. <laughs> How much? For a hundred dollars. I said, that's ridiculous. Nobody ever paid a hundred dollars for a drawing from a five-year-old kid. He says, well, take it or leave it. <laughs> That's resilience. So I, I peel a hundred dollars out of my pocket and give it to him. And he says, boy, that's an easy hundred bucks. He lives two blocks from the World Trade Center. He makes a lot of pictures of what he saw that day. And he earned his entire college tuition uh, selling his pain. That's, that's dealing with trauma and really, uh, that's the American way. Maybe the Israeli way also. Very <laughs> uh, why was I so desperate to get this picture? Because of this. He's a five and a half year old drawing what he saw. Plane flying in the World Trade Center, people jumping out, firefighters, telephone booths that no longer work. And I say, so what's that? He says, you know, when the plane hit, there was this fireball and the heat of the fireball came through the window and I thought we were going to get burned up. And I think, yeah, that's how people remember trauma. It's a sensation, it's not a story. It's an image. Anybody who I have seen who escaped from the World Trade Center feels it in their body, feels the sound. They get triggered by sounds. Uh, people who have been sexually abused are triggered by smells or by touch. Uh, so it's a particular sensation. Um, and then I say, so what's that over here? He says, oh, that's a trampoline. And I say, what's a trampoline doing there? He says, so that when people jump out of the World Trade Center, we can catch them and they will be okay. I go, holy Moses. 
Our president has come on TV two days before, and his opening line is, we will kill them dead or alive. And I go, oh my God, the leader of the free world is a limbic man who responds like a dog who has been upset. There is no intervening front lobe action of how else you can do. Don't be like that. Use your frontal lobe, guys. Uh, because the world will get destroyed if you don't use your frontal lobe. And so here's this five and a half year, half year old kid who has a frontal lobe. And the reason why I wanted this picture is because when you're a traumatist, your imagination goes and that sound means you're getting raped. That image means that you're going to die. And so there's no lack of intervening response. All good trauma therapies evolve imagination. Imagining new realities. There's many ways of doing it. Uh, you need to see how things are different. Um, I happen to personally love um, theater. I love sensory motor psychotherapy. I love Sentry therapy. Um, I love J.K. Rowling, who has a terrible trauma history and who escaped by creating Harry Potter stories and made brought blessings to the whole world by her imagination. Life is about imagining new possibilities. Good luck imagining how Israel and Palestine can solve the issues. My imagination fails me. I hope yours doesn't. Um, so, next chapter. Um, in 1999, I got a phone call from a foundation that says, Dr. Van der Kolk, we'll be following your work, and we would like to fund you to do a study on how trauma affects learning. And I say, boy, nobody's ever called to offer me money. It's fantastic. This is a great day of my life. Uh, but have you read the work of Dante Cicchetti, who has written extensively about it? And they say, no. Have you read about Alan Shroof? And they say, no. Have you read Frank Putnam, and they say no. So I said, you know, we don't need more studies on who, how trauma affects learning. We need to actually have a system where people learn all that stuff that we know already. Uh, even the last two days, a whole bunch of people came to have this great research idea. I said, yeah, some very good work on that, done by about 15 different people. So maybe if you read the literature, you can actually move the field further rather than reinventing the wheel. Okay? Um, and so I say to my these wonderful funders, you know, it's very nice, I'd like to do another study, but it would really be a waste if nobody reads the study once again. So the issue is not that we don't know, we don't know, the issue is that nobody reads this stuff and there is no discipline where people learn about the effect of trauma and learning. So he said, let's have a convocation with members of the Senate, Ted Kennedy's healthcare advisors, some other senators, some high mucky mucks in the government, some, high, some of my friends who are a good trauma child therapist, including Claude Chemtov, actually was part of that also. We get together for three days and we decided to set up a national child traumatic stress network. We, t we go to Congress in America, which at that time used to be functional, um, they actually did things at the time, and they fund $40 million uh, per year to fund a child, National Child Traumatic Stress Network, uh, which now is all over the US, and all of these different places are talking to each other, somewhere over there is us. And um, so, but I first like to talk about what do we actually know? Uh, all this stuff that already was there. And so the first person I need to mention is Dante Cicchetti. How many people have read Dante Cicchetti? How many people have read Sigmund Freud? Read Dante Cicchetti. Uh, so Dante was a, in my junior faculty member at Harvard when I was there also. And Dante is a beautiful man who is a spare, in his spare time a fashion designer whose hair falls down to his butt. If you go for that, he's a beautiful man. Um, he does amazing work. Um, when he comes up for tenure, the faculty at Harvard thinks he's not our type, so he doesn't get tenure. 
even though he is actually one of the great men of my generation. What does he do? He sets up a school camp, a summer camp, with abused kids and normal kids, and he videotapes their behaviors. Uh, he videotapes their learning patterns. They video he videotapes their play patterns, and start really talking about how developmentally traumatized kids are different from uh, other kids. Then he gets to see how peer relationships are different, how learning things are different, how sensory integration things are different, and then he also shows that at the time that the time that the trauma happens has a very different impact on the long-term effect, something that I never hear clinicians talk about, but we should talk about these things if we want to develop really effective treatments. We need to be much more precise in our characterization of the deficits of the things that we try to cure. The next person I need to mention is my colleague and friend, Carlin Lyons Ruth, who is also in my hometown. And it starts with this. It starts with something that I really resonate with, namely when I was in medical school, I delivered about 13, 30 children to 14 and 15 year old single girls. And that's quite a little growth experience for a young boy. And what really uh, bothered me is how these girls didn't seem to have any visitors. So I said to them in my innocent little way, I've noticed that nobody has come to visit you, how do you think you go to raise this little baby? And their answer was horrifying. They said, don't worry about it, dog. I've always wanted to have a baby and we'll go home and we'll take care of each other. And as a 24 year old boy, I knew that little babies don't take care of their mothers. And this was a setup for disaster. So that's just the sort of question that got Carlin really interested in what would have happened to these kids. So two years later, she makes home visitation. And it ter turns out that 86% of these kids are very troubled kids, uh, mainly of the aggressive variety. In the US, maybe not in Israel, if you're a two, year, two and a half year old pain in the ass kid, the likelihood that you'll ever get off that trajectory is extremely slim. This is pretty much a condemned for a lifetime of dysfunction. Um, so Carla looks at the literature and she uh, identifies the most single most effective uh, therapeutic intervention known to mankind, namely home visitations where you help mothers to hold and respond to their kids and to be in rhythm with each other, the methods of David Olds. In the year 2000, John Heckman won the Nobel Prize for analyzing that particular treatment, and he discovered that for every dollar that the society invests in mother-child interaction therapy, the society uh, harvests seven dollars. It benefits in the long range of people finishing school, become tax abiding, tax paying citizens, not going to jail, and stuff like that. So he, uh, Carlin basically tries to teach her mothers to be like one of my favorite people, to be really in tune and in touch and uh, synchronous with their babies. I almost start crying when I said, actually, I miss that guy. Man, do I miss that guy. Um, so she does this for half a year, and then after half a year, the kids are so much better. And then something happens to her that has happened to every single one of my really innovative friends. The rug gets pulled out from underneath her, and she loses her funding. It's happened to me a bunch of times, it happened to Frank Putnam, I could mention just one long list of people who are terrific innovators, and somebody doesn't like the work that we do. Um, I'll leave it up to your own paranoid ideas why that is. So Carla loses her funding, has never done anything wrong, she has a little bit of money left, continues with a small sample, at the end her kids after a year and a half are almost as well as the control grids. So a very effective treatment. But what's even more interesting about Carla's work is that she um, takes videotapes. And those videotapes for me are stunning videotapes because they tell me something about what happens here. 
So she does these very main type attachment tapes where her kid is playing, mom comes into the room, uh, you videotape the mom, you see mom sort of eager to show what a good mom she is, picks up the kid. If you look really carefully, but most of us would miss it, you see the mom just being a little bit out of touch with the kid and the kid moving back a little bit, but nothing worries her. Six months later, mom comes to the room, kid is, kid is playing, baby looks up, looks away. Mom picks the kid up and the kid mo sort of moves back. Not good. Six months later, mom comes to the room, baby looks up, starts smiling, falls on the ground. Mom picks the baby up and the baby, baby flop, flops back. And I go, oh, that's how it starts. I've always been intrigued how people get to abuse their children because child abuse is against the law of God and men and Darwin and everything about it. It's not normal to abuse your kids. There's something really just really messed up about it. How do people get to abuse their kids? And in this videotape you see that because this, kid, this mom and the kids are so out of tune at this point that the, mom, the kids have come to see their moms as traumatic triggers. The kids try to avoid the mom. The moms are probably traumatized people in their own right. So they say, my kid makes me feel even worse about myself than I feel already. And then this stuff starts. Um, so that is also very important to me. And then uh, life is all about politics. And a very interesting thing happens that 13 years after um, Carl Luther funding, the priest abuse scandal that you in Israel probably don't know all that much about, um, as the rest of the world, uh, breaks out in Boston. It turns out that there were 298 pedophile priests in the Archdiocese of Boston who were molesting kids. And all hell breaks loose. My boss, for example, at the time is a Jesuit priest who is trying to cover things up for the cardinal, so my clinic has closed down. And all kinds of disasters happen everywhere. But one of the results of this, this whole priest abuse scandal is that there's some money becomes available for people saying maybe abuse may not be good for kids, even though people say most of this abuse is called by a false memory syndrome of um, therapists implanting false memories in their patients' minds. Um, and so Carlin gets some money to follow up her kids and to see what happens to them. She tries to locate him in the Department of Mental Health, Social Services, in jail. And it turns out that about half of her kids are there now. And it turns out that these kids have all kinds of problems. And the main problem is dissociation. These kids cannot feel. They have borderline features. They are, have affect dysregulation. They don't feel their bodies. They don't have a sense of pleasure. They don't have a sense of agency. And they are major behavioral problems, just like the kids that you see now. There's a quote from Winnicott that very much also goes with it. Because what turns out is that the lack of responsivity and synchrony at age two predicts these behaviors at age 16 and 17 of these kids. And then uh, at the same time, uh, a student of mine does this research that shows indeed that if you have this early childhood trauma stuff, that the areas of your brain has, have to do with self-awareness, knowing who you are, knowing what you are and what you stand for, actually get severely damaged. So early childhood trauma, I mean, you have no resonance and no mirror neural system that's reflected by others leads to very severe brain damage, I hope to talk about it. Until what time do I have? What? And a half hour? So I have till 3.30? I think I'll go to 3.45. I have a lot of good stuff to show, if that's okay. Okay, good. Um, so, 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 so then Cardin correlates the behavior of these teenagers as she sees that the big predictor of borderline out of control behavior at the 16, 17 is lack of verbal comforting engagement in the home and emotional and physical control in the home. 
And then does she does another study. It's very interesting. And when you're a researcher, you should never be married to your results because she shows that the data that Judy Herman and I came up with about borderline personality disorder were fundamentally wrong. It's always nice. Research shows you that things are different. So what does Colin shows is that these symptoms that we blamed on trauma and neglect, but Colin's data, prospective data show, it's all the result of lack of attunement between the mother and the child. And if you're not being attuned to as a kid, then you're more likely to also have trauma episodes, but the trauma episodes are secondary to the lack of having a attuned relationship to your parents. I think that's sort of important information because it has something to do with how do we help people to feel attuned to, how to be, to be known, et cetera, et cetera. And then we do a study. Uh, I was the head of the ESM for uh, PTSD committee. And what uh, the study shows is that kids' PTSD symptoms are due to traumas huh? as specific events, but all the other stuff that we see in our practice, anger expression, suicidality, self-injurious behavior, difficulty with relationships with others, um, cumulative victimization, the somatic complaints are all a function of the attachment system, of broken attachment systems, okay? Then there's Frank Putnam, and then there's Alan Shroof. We have all these prospective studies, and then we have Colvin Trevartan, who starts to study a very important thing, namely that our, our brain is shaped by the experience that we have early on, and if we are being seen and known and acknowledged, exactly the part of the brain that allow you to know yourself, come online, having feelings for others come online, and having feelings for yourself. And so then there's a new piece of uh, research that comes online, uh, mainly from my friend Marty Teicher, also in my hometown, um, who starts looking at how different forms of abuse at different ages have different effects on brain development. Very important. If we as, as clinicians want to develop the most effective treatments, we should be much more precise diagnostically in what is going on here and how can I precisely change this system. So let me just quickly show what the accumulative evidence is of chronic abuse and neglect in children. Uh, it affects the amygdala, so it changes your threat detection. Everybody knows that. It also affects your ventral prefrontal cortex. The capacity, uh, does, uh, in my book I call the ventral prefrontal cortex, the watchtower, the part of your brain that knows what goes in, on inside of you. When you get traumatized, you don't know what's happening inside of you. You have no internal self-awareness. This is called alexithymia, for those of you who are followers of Henry Crystal or the old psychoanalysts. It also affects the orbital prefrontal cortex. The orbital prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that if you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you have a really angry thoughts about the Australian Prime Minister and want to tweet him, uh, you put your, uh, your cell phone back on the desk and you put your hand on your wife's bum and go back to sleep. But if you don't have an orbital prefrontal cortex, you cannot inhibit yourself. You have to do that sort of stuff. Very relevant to the work that we do. Uh, very relevant for um, juvenile justice. I'm sure that in Israel, like in America, all juvenile justice programs are based on finger wagging. If you keep doing this terrible, things will keep happening to you. <laughs> no, it's that way, not that way. <laughs> uh, but, but when you're a juvenile delinquent who has been abused and neglected, you don't have a finger wagging receptor. No matter how often you warn people that bearable things will happen to you, it doesn't come in. You cannot control that. And as I talked about yesterday, maybe martial arts or boxing 
might be a hell of a lot more effective ways of building up an inhibitory system in your brain and the medial prefrontal cortex than any psychological intervention known to mankind. In America, I like to say, if any of you have a trust fund, I would love to do a study comparing tango dancing with cognitive behavioral treatment, or certainly capoeira with CBT for uh, traumatized kids. And I have a good hypothesis about which one will work better, because once you know how the brain works, you know that cognition won't get you there. You cannot get there by understanding and insight. Uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, part of your brain gives you a sense of time, that's offline, everything that's bad happens to you, feels like this will last forever, it will not be over. And lastly, very central to my thinking and the work that I do and the research I do, is um, uh, the anterior cingulate, which allows you to understand what is uh, relevant and what's irrelevant. And trauma really messes up the part of your brain that tells you what is worth paying attention to. Actually, I hope to have a minute to talk about it at the end. So that's stuff, stuff, stuff. All these differences that happen in the brain. And then we all know all these wonderful things from monkeys. This is Stephen Sumi who, who got Harlow's monkeys and show if you have a, a safe mom, you have a completely different biology than if you have a mom who is scary. Uh, all very well worked out, all very well worth reading some degree summarized in my book. And then we start the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and we have finally have a chance to see how we can treat traumatized kids. And but the, what the network is about is sort of a race of who can develop uh, the, mo the, mo the treatment that will can get you most money and research grants. The first thing that gets, um, gets developed is single incidence trauma, CBT. And I think to myself, that's not why we set up the network. The network was really about dealing with domestic violence and kids growing up under chronically dangerous circumstances. So my group then uh, does a survey of 22,000 children in the network and see what sort of trauma happens in American kids, which is probably very similar to what happens in Israeli kids. Most common thing, childhood emotional abuse. Second most common, losing a parent to the war, to jail, to mental illness, um, having an impaired caregiver, domestic violence, childhood sexual abuse, neglect, childhood physical abuse. And this being America, our Senate says, you need to find out how traumatized kids are by Osama bin Laden and by Muslims. And it turns out that is not an issue for America's children. Maybe something to also in Israel to also pay attention to who are really the people who are truly dangerous to uh, your welfare. Um, I have no opinion about it, so you forget about it. And then we look at what do these kids suffer from? And what do they suffer from? is major problems with affect dysregulation, major problems with attention and concentration, major problems with hating themselves, not sending themselves, major problems with impulse control, major problems with aggression and risk taking. And after we collect all these data and do a survey of the literature of 200,000 people, we get together and form a committee and send a recommendation to the American Psychiatric Association to create a new diagnosis called Developmental Trauma Disorder that captures the reality of kids who are traumatized in the context of their intimate, um, of their caregivers. Does anybody you ever see here people who were traumatized in the context of intimate? Anybody ever not see people who were? Uh, uh, this is, as far as I know, the bulk of what we do for a living sort of important to do that right. Uh, so um, a month after we submit our proposal, you may uh, recognize some of the names here, I give a talk to all the commissioners of mental health in the United States, and they really like what I have to say, and they say, we are 
an organization of all the commissioners, all the different states, and we uh, uh, spent 29.5 public mental health service dollars, and uh, we urge you to make this the most important priority in your development of DSM-5. I go, well, that's great. I can go home and go back to actually doing work while I'm doing stupid politics. And so what is the development of trauma disorder? Uh, you have experienced terrible things in the context of a caregiving system that is not there for you, that doesn't make you better, and it leads to problems with affect dysregulation, like an inability to modulate, tolerate, or recover from extreme affect states, anger, shame, to prolonged temper tantrums, immobilization. You ever see anything like that in your practice? Um, disturbance, this is very much my thing, disturbance in bodily functions, eating, sleeping, elimination, overreactive, underreactive, sounds and touch, uh, diminished awareness of anything, um, impaired capacity to describe states. Second piece, problem with attention and concentration, preoccupation with threats, impaired capacity for self-protection, habitual self-harm, stuff like that, and then issue of the self, hating yourself, hating other people, being aggressive, not being able to really form intimate friendships with anybody else, because the world is always dangerous and you do things. Um, so we submit that. And then a month later, we get a report from the American Psychiatric Association. It says, this is very confusing. You know, all this stuff and all these things that happen to a person, and all these 200 papers that you submitted, uh, I think it's too hard to submit it. But if in the next 26 days, you give us a paper about the genetics of this disorder, the epigenetics of the disorder, the cultural variations of the disorder, the um, long-term prognosis of the disorder, the familiar patterns of the disorder, and five other things, none of which is known for any psychiatric disorder, we will uh, reconsider. So why is it that people don't want to look at this? And then something very bad happens. Namely, I start looking at the newspaper to buy a scuba diving shop in Curaçao. Um, I've had it. But we have postdoctoral students. And postdoctoral students are a mixed bag. The good things about them is that they are very smart. They really know the statistics. They can go nights without sleeping and work their asses off. They are generally quite pleasant, fairly nice to look at. Uh, that's all great things. The bad thing is that they don't have a cynical bone in their body and think that the truth will eventually come out. So there's a revolt on by our postdoctoral students that says, let's do it. And in 24 days, we interview 20,000 children according to all the by far the best field trial for DSM-5. And then Brad Stolbeck analyzes attachment issues versus non-attachment issues comes very well. And then two months later, we get a response from the American Psychiatric Association, the DSM-5 committee, that says uh, this. The consensus was there's just a little evidence at this time and to include DTD in the DSM-5. The notion that early childhood adverse experiences lead to substantial development of disruptions is more clinical intuition than research-based fact. This statement is commonly made, but it cannot be backed up by prospective studies, even though we had submitted uh, about um, 18 prospective studies over a 30-year period. So what is it about our society that's unwilling to see who we treat and the reality of who we treat? which means that we cannot study what we do, because as long as your patients don't exist, we don't know, we cannot figure out. We can just give each other um, sort of anecdotal information. It's very hard to do research. So on the other hand, we have a law of choice. Um, we can call our patients PTSD, disruptive mood regulation, reactive attachment disorder, 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 not disorder, when there's explosive disorder, position of five, call them disorder, borderline person. We can call them all those things, depending in America, maybe not in Israel, on what your insurance company will reimburse you for. How low have we sunk? 
Can you imagine to a, going to a cardiologist who gives you a diagnosis on the basis of what the insurance company will pay him for rather than what's going on with your heart? But our profession lives in La La Land. And I'm astounded that clinicians are actually willing to live in La La Land and give patients bullshit diagnoses that have actually almost nothing to do with the reality of what you deal with. You're being Israelis who are known to be fairly opinionated and um, strong-minded people. I would encourage you to actually talk about these things and talk about the reality of what we treat. My comfort is that, at least luckily, my book has been sadly, sadly outselling the DSM-5. Uh, <laughs> so that's good. Uh, so why is this important? It's very important because we need to define what, go, what we need to do and need to define what works. Do we need to do affect regulation? Do we do sensory integration? Do we, how do we fun deal with executive functioning? How do we deal with traumatic reenactments? How do we deal with interpersonal? Uh, how do we deal with frozen bodies? How do we deal with dissociative uh, disorder and, and self injurious behavior? And how do we deal with that people switch between very different states from time to time? These are all different aspects, all of which need to be addressed separately. Uh, and when people say the relationship will work, I have some data I almost showed in here of. Um, most of us, when we meet somebody with a kind face and a sweet voice, our brains calm down. I have some nice videos, uh, some brain scans about how traumatized people with childhood trauma look at the kind face and the sweet voice. And what lights up is the periaqueductal gray, the part of the brain that are called the cockroach brain, the terrified part of the brain. And so our assumption that when we are nice and sweet to people, we will make them feel safe, is a mistaken notion. Our patients who have been abused and neglected do not necessarily see us as safe people, and we may become the problems. So let me just finish with um, two things. Uh, so how do you overcome trauma? First of all, we are social animals. Uh, so establish community, terribly important. How do we establish community? By moving together, singing together, drumming together, making music together. This is the brain scan of brain scans that my friend Yuri Kopitov in St. Petersburg just did, of kids singing together. And singing together dramatically changes their brain. Second piece is talking. You need to be able to tell the truth. Uh, and they're perfectly great champion is John Bowlby, whose favorite saying, as far as I'm concerned, was, what cannot be communicated to the mother cannot be communicated to the self. And so being able to say what happens is critical. If you cannot say it, it goes into your body and it didn't happen. So talking is important. And how do you do it? But in any way you can. This happens to be a series of drawings. I'm not going to explain because I want to show about one more thing before we start. And that is that uh, oftentimes people come out to me and try to tell me about their own favorite treatment. I get more advice for favorite treatments than all of you combined. Uh, nobody feels good unless I adopt that treatment. Uh, and that's sometimes pleasant, sometimes not so pleasant. Um, and about 25 years, 20 years ago, people start telling me about neurofeedback. I say, do you know about neurofeedback? And I say, no, what is it? He said, well, you can put electrodes on people's skulls. You can harvest the brainwave below it. You can project those brainwaves on a computer screen. And you can create games that give feedback to the brain that reward certain brain forms and don't support other ones. And I think, that's cool. Um, Show me your research. I always say, show me your research. So nothing appears in the mail. And then the man I call my best friend, Alexander McFarland, does a very important study that is very relevant to all of us. And it shows how normal people, including kids, uh, who are traumatized versus kids who are not traumatized, process information. 
And this is the response to an ordinary thing like a sound like eh. When you make me make a sound like that, you go like, is he so sick and tired of talking to us? Or has he lapsed into his native tongue? Or is he unwell? Your brain needs to do something to figure out what I'm saying. And what turns out that normal people, if there are such people, um, when they hear a sound like this, all different parts of the brain are working together to figure out what it is. When you're traumatized, there is an internal desynchronization and all the parts of the brain are not working together. And specifically in a normal brain, you generate a wave that filters out everything else and say, don't pay attention to anything else until you figure out what <coughs> means. Traumatized people, no filtering capacity. Next thing is, a normal person creates a P300, which is a learning wave of the brain that we take things in and learn stuff. And when you're traumatized, you have a lousy P300. It's very hard to learn things when you're traumatized because your brain is all muddled up. And I look at that and I go, look, oh my God, how are you ever going to address that? And then I meet Sigrid Fisher, who teaches me about neurofeedback. And she says, here I was treating this eight-year-old kid, and that is his family drawing. And I say, that's a pretty lousy family drawing. And then she says, I do 20 sessions of neurofeedback, and that's his family drawing. I go, that's pretty good. I do 20 more sessions, and that's his drawing. And if you already know treatments that can do that in three months, you should definitely not learn neurofeedback. But if you can, I would like to hear about it. Because I never knew of anything that can do that and can change people's capacity to represent their reality in three months in that way. So let me show you a dumb little movie about neurofeedback. Not bad. Huh? And so you learn about neurofeedback, you learn about brainwaves, you learn about sort of stuff, and you get to work and you do studies. And so here's an example. And so here's a Somali refugee boy um, who is completely out of control. We do a quantitative EEG on him. Much easier to do than a brain scan. Uh, not as good resolution, but cost about $350 to do it in your office. And what you see is his frontal lobe is all in delta, means that his frontal lobe is asleep. I would very much like to encourage people to do quantitative EGs. And when you see quantitative EGs and you look, you understand them, you go like, oh my God, I wonder how that this kid is actually able to do anything. And you see how messed up these brains are. It's astounding. And then we train him for um, 20 sessions in his frontal lobe, because normal lobe, he's no blood. Then we do a study on adults, and published it in PLOS One, very good results of PTSD. But the interesting thing, and it's both true for the adult study and the child study we have done, is we train the brain over here. We train the brain in the primitive fear center of the brain in the limbic system, where basically sort of trauma sits, that whole upset, out of control part of the brain is not in the frontal lobe, it's back there. And what do we see? Huge differences in affect regulation, uh, susceptibility to the influence, interpersonal conflict. Basically, by training down the fear-driven brain, what we see as a dramatic improvement in executive functioning and planning and decision-making, error correction, that mental flexibility, dealing with danger, stuff like that. Same with kids, uh, kids' brains before and after. Uh, study is now finished, being published. So basically that's what we are into. I'd love to end with a quote by Freud. Uh, all this trauma sits in that nether survival part of your brain that keeps telling you're in danger, the world hates you, you're a terrible person. And basically what all of our job is to strengthen the self from the lobe, to widen the field of perception and enlarge its organization. It can appropriate fresh portion of it, that stuff that sits out there, where it was, I shall come to be. It's a work of culture, not unlike the training of the Zuiderze. Freud writes it in 1932 when it just started to train the Zuiderze. Uh, took till about 1958 to join, to train the Zuiderze. So this is not a 
quick fix. But if you keep doing it and try all kind of different methods, sooner or later you will get there. Thank you very much. Let me call up her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. If we um, uh, have time at the end, then we will have time for questions. Okay, but right now, we always invite an Israeli discussant to these public lectures to be able to respond from our country. So I would like to invite our very own Ruth Patorenchik, um, PhD. She's a professor of social work at, at, at the School of Social Work and Social Welfare here at Hebrew University, a clinical psychologist who received her PhD also from here and completed her postdoctoral training at the University of California in San Diego. Her current research topics focus on risk and protective factors for childhood PH PTSD, relational trauma, emotion regulation, and post-traumatic growth, and she co-edited the books Treating Traumatized Children risk, resilience, and recovery, and helping children cope with trauma, individual, family, and community ex perspectives. And here you go. Thank you very much. Um, I'll stay here for a second. Ah, great. Uh, Thank you, you so want much. Help to, yes. to be in sync. To be in sync. Right. <laughs> well, are we seeing this? I thought how fortunate it is uh, to speak after Dr. Ben Bezel van der Kool. Now I think how unfortunate it is to speak after Bezel van der Kool. Uh, it is a great honor and a wonderful opportunity to be here today, and I would like to thank the organizers of this fifth annual conference of the memory, uh, on the memory of Patricia van Horn, Dr. Paula David, Professor Asher ben Ariyeh and Haruf Center for their generous invitation and to thank uh, Dr. Bezel van der Kool for a very inspiring lecture. I think Patricia would have been very curious to hear about the latest development and insight on trauma and attachment disruptions, no less about the new directions and innovative methods for recovery. First, I will highlight the major lesson that we learned from Patricia Van Horn, from Alicia Lieberman, from Bezel van der Kool. And then I will describe how we applied these insights in our research on early childhood trauma and in the development of a new clinical intervention for young children and parents. I remember how the Israel Center for the Treatment of Psychotrauma invited Alicia Lieberman Patricia Van Horn, Chandra Ghosh Ippen, and other colleagues from the University of California, San Francisco, for a conference on treating traumatized children at the Hebrew University in spring 2009. This conference actually changed the trajectory of training of many Israeli professionals. It definitely played a central role in putting the topic of early childhood trauma, infant mental health, and child parent psychotherapy at the center of our academic and clinical attention. Since then, we have developed at the Hebrew University a special training in infant mental health, and Dr. Paula David and Haruf Center created the wonderful program of CPP, child parent psychotherapy. From the lecture given by Patricia Van Horn back then in 2009, I, uh, it was entitled Training to Build Capacity to Provide Services. I remember the main message, which was, there are effective ways to treat childhood trauma, and we need to provide services as soon as possible with a focus on the primary and most meaningful relationship. The inspiring book of Bezel van der Kolk on Buddy, The Buddy Keeps the Score has been at the center of many professional meetings. I know that here in Israel, there are groups of therapists who meet regularly for systematic discussion of its various topics and implications. We learn from Judith Herman and from Basil van der Kolk how important it is for trauma therapists to connect 
and to elaborate together on these complex and painful topics. In a way, these books, this book brings us together. And in a way, I felt here that Bezel was in synchrony with the audience, and that felt so good in our body too. I read the book in small bites, pausing to think, to reflect on my clinical experience, and to integrate the new insights and revelations that often provided deeper perspective. Moreover, I could share some of these revelations with my traumatized patients, and they often felt understood. The students uh, here, I'm um, uh, sitting among the audience, are familiar with both Patricia Van Horn, Alicia Lieberman, and Bessel van der Kolk writing. They are including in the reading list for, in my courses on trauma and resilience. In fact, they have a lot in common in their deep understanding of the complex childhood trauma and in their keen enthusiasm for treatment and recovery and innovative ways of treatment and recovery. The more they understand the pervasive damage of attachment disruption to the development, the more they are committed to effective and relational treatment, and they both reiterate the message. Safe connections are fundamental to recovery, and that healing is about restoring the process of development of trust in a significant relationship. I will just mention a few similar theoretical and clinical emphasis. The first and the most important one is the focus on the primary and most meaningful relationship and the construct of synchronicity, a term that both Patricia and Bezel used to describe the delicate yet so natural healthy way to create bi-directional communication and relationship. According to Patricia Van Horn, when development takes place in optimal relational environment, there is a synchronistic interplay between mother and baby in which each matches the other affective patterns, allowing recreation of the other in their own inner psychobiological states. Van der Kolk says, being in sync with oneself and with others requires integration in the body based on the senses, vision, hearing, touch, balance. And if this doesn't happen in infancy, there is an increased chance for later sensory integration problems. Later, I will show our research that actually looked at it and documented it. The construct of synchronicity describes kind of an ordinary magic which is part of mother-child early relationship. Ruth Feldman used microanalysis to research these dyadic interactions that create the synchrony. She argued that the synchrony is very specific to the parent-baby interaction and that children and parents' brains coordinate during those moments and how the parent's mature brain extremely regulates the infant immature brain. Many other related concepts such as parental attunement, parental sensitivity, parental warmth, reflective functioning, mentalization, save and return, reciprocity, mirroring, they all describe the process of developing attachment which is a foundation of healthy development. All of them try to capture the core aspect of this central developmental achievement, which make, makes all the difference for future life and the creation of future meaningful relationship. And I quote here another beautiful sentence from the book. Early attachment patterns create the inner maps that chart our relationship throughout life, not only in terms of what we expect from others, but also in terms of how much comfort and pleasure we can experience in their presence. Second, the need to identify trauma in early childhood. Alicia Lieberman, Patricia Van Horn, Bezel van der Koel, they all confronted us with a deeply rooted tendency to deny childhood trauma. 
Patricia pointed out that uh, we tend to idealize infancy as er early childhood period of time and safe and carefree time of life. And in fact, there, are, there has been little research on the incidence of trauma among infant toddlers and preschoolers. And Bezalis and his colleagues, they put forward the DTD, the Developmental Trauma Disorder Diagnosis, and convinced us with the need to better capture the identity and the broad clinical phenomena of developmental trauma disorder, which goes beyond PTSD and which emphasize the regulation problems. We are now more aware of it, and we are aware that many children who suffer from neglect and abuse may receive multiple diagnoses which may distract the clinicians from identifying the core developmental trauma and the complex PTSD that can be at the center of the distress. And thus may lead to ineffective treatment failing to address the central developmental trauma. We listened carefully to this call and actually started to do more research on early childhood trauma. And the accumulating evidence is alarming, both in terms of high incidence of traumatic stressors that affect young children below the age of five, but also there is evidence that young children disproportionately are the direct victims of violence, with children from birth to age of three having higher rate of morbidity and mortality due to physical abuse. Third, the understanding that trauma is stored in the body and there is bi-directional communication between body and mind. Patricia wrote that the body responds to highly stressful stimuli with a dynamic process that involves multiple systems. And Van der Kolb phrased it in his book, trauma reshapes both body and brain, compromising sufferers' capacities for pleasure engagement, self-control, and trust. They also pointed out to the link between trauma and dysregulation, and to the growing understanding how trauma impairs regulation in all domains, emotional, physical, cognitive, and interpersonal. And fourth, the promise of intervention. Alicia, Patricia, Bezel repeatedly describe in depth the long-lasting and pervasive consequences of trauma, abuse, and neglect. And at the same time, their great belief in attachment-based treatment for childhood trauma led them to write, teach, and train many clinicians in effective trauma treatment. There are angels in the nursery and also in therapy rooms. They belong to a growing group of optimistic, proactive, social activists group of trauma experts that believe that bonding and building relationship can heal, but also we need to learn how to integrate body-focused treatment into trauma recovery work, including specific methods to rewire the brain. It is not surprising that the lecture we just heard addressed innovative treatment modalities such as uh, yoga, role-playing, dance, meditation, and as it's written in the book, the approaches to healing damage attunement system need to include training in rhythmicity and reciprocity. These insights are, in are in the basis of our latest intervention developed to enhance awareness of emotion and bodily sensation and to strengthen the capacity of emotion and physical regulation. And now I will move to briefly describe our research in Israel on early childhood trauma and on relational emotion regulation and relational trauma. And relational trauma was defined by Sheringa and Zina as the co-occurrence of post-traumatic stress simultaneously in parent and child, and most likely the symptomatology of the parents exacerbate the symptomatology of the child. And it's also co-regulation that influence from both sides. 
We search for mediating and moderating factors in relational PTSD. Now when I talk about my research, I can leave the, the papers. Um, and we are aware of the fact that parental post-traumatic distress and parental depression and PTSD uh, influence child post-traumatic symptoms and distress. But the more interesting questions are how does this happen? What are the mechanisms by which the influence of the parental distress affect the child? And there are many theoretical explanations through attachment, reflective functioning, parental attunement, parental competence, but we chose to focus on parental emotion regulation. And the reason we chose parental emotion regulation is because we believe parental emotion regulation can be taught, can be practiced, can be improved or promoted, and we want to develop services and treatment to improve them. So the, the idea, the rationale for, our, for our, our study was to look at the construct of emotion regulation and to see how it can be helpful for understanding the intergenerational transmission of trauma and how we can contribute to promoting better abilities of emotion regulation so we can mitigate the distress transmitted from the mother to child and how we can translate it to clinical interventions. So this is my favorite star, uh, slide showing how the mother regulates herself and that helps her to co-regulate the child and then the child learn to regulate himself or herself. But when, the tr when trauma strikes, it makes this task of self-regulation much more complicated. And if the mother suffers from post-traumatic symptoms, it's much harder for her to regulate herself and then more complicated to provide this sensitivity, attunement, reflective functioning, etc., good modeling and co-regulate her child under stress that both of them are experiencing. And then the child may have a problem uh, to learn to self-regulate himself and can develop all kind of behavior problem, problems, emotional problems, etc. And that makes uh, the life of the mother and the task of co-regulation even more complicated. So I'll briefly describe two studies that we did, one based on a large representative study, a uh, sample of Israeli society of young children and mother, and the other based on a smaller sample of children who grow, grew in uh, the Roth area and were exposed to multiple and continual traumatic stress. Before we explain the results or show the results, I just want to show you how, how we assess maternal emotion regulation, how we operationalize it, and how we assess it using this uh, questionnaire that has the following subscales, the ability of the mother to accept her emotional responses, or this difficulties uh, of the mother to engage in goal-directed behavior because of her emotion, problems in impulse control, problems in, uh, in ability to be aware of the emotions, or limit access to emotion regulation strategies, or no, no emotional clarity or little emotional clarity. All these aspects assess problems in emotion regulation of the mother. And just a quick slide to show that maternal emotion re regulation is not synonymous of maternal post-traumatic distress because we may argue that we just invented a new term for an old phenomena and that uh, maternal emotion regulation and maternal PTSD are actually describing the same thing. And this correlation shows that this is not the case. The correlation is around 0.43 which is uh, moderate high. So what we found, we did kind of a mediation analysis and the, media the meaning of this mediation analysis is that the difficulties of the mothers in regulating her own emotions mediate between maternal post-traumatic distress and the child problems. And we found it in 
internalizing problems, in externalizing problems, in regulation problems, and in PTSD symptoms, and we published quite a lot of studies about this. We also did some longitudinal studies to follow the children that grew up under continuous traumatic stress. We actually assessed them when they were between the ages of two to four, living in Jderot, near Gaza Strip, and then we reassessed them after seven years to see how they are, were doing seven years later at the age of uh, 10, 11. So we did it in 2005, seven, and then again, 2012 and 13, just before the break of the one of the war. And we found four longitudinal courses. This is just to illustrate. The interesting thing that the resilient longitudinal course, which is defined that these children were not suffering for significant symptoms at the age of three, and when they were reassessed, still they didn't have significant um, symptoms. They were resistant at the age of three, they were resistant at the age of 11, and we called it resilient trajectory. Was the most common trajectory. More than half of the children were fine then, and fine seven years later. Then we had another uh, longitudinal course of recover, those who had symptoms when they were younger, but when we reassessed them, didn't suffer from significant distress, and they had, uh, they were 18% of the sample. Uh, those who developed symptoms, didn't have symptoms at young age, but developed them later, and we don't know exactly as a result of what, percent, and the chronic distress was found in 11 percent. More result of this study showed that there was more stability than change over, the, over time. Those who were distressed most likely remained distressed. 70 percent of them remained dis in distress. Those who were resilient most likely remained resilient. And as I said, resilient was the most common longitudinal co course, which shows that resilience is common rather than uncommon. We also found that maternal post-traumatic symptoms predicted the chronic distress of the children. I didn't bring here the, the results because we don't have the time. I just bring you the, the summary of the results. But not surprisingly, what, could, what predicts the distress of the chronic distress of the children was the their mother's chronic distress. Recently, together with Aviv, uh, Dr. Aviva Yuchman, who sits here, and I'm sure you were very pleased with the sensory integration problem that uh, Dr. Van der Kolk described, because the occupational therapists are experts in sensory modulation problems, and actually it was Aviva who, together we collaborated and looked at the result how maternal post-traumatic symptoms actually was associated with executive functioning of the child, with sensory processing problem of the child, and that show it in different ways, emotional, uh, uh, sensory, and behavioral. In a very recent uh, paper that is still uh, under review, uh, Aviva showed that those children who suffer from PTSD, those are in the right uh, histogram, have higher rate of sensory modulation problem. It's like 31% uh, of them suffer from definite uh, sensory modulation problem, and another 31% suffer from probable, if I understand it right, Aviva. And you can see the huge difference between those children who suffer from PTSD as compared to children who do not suffer from PTSD. And that really opened our eyes to look at the broad picture that being exposed to continuous traumatic stress is beyond PTSD symptoms. It's spread to regulation problem that includes beyond emotion regulation, also sensory regulation problems and executive functioning problems. And that means what, what it means to suffer from PTSD distress or from post-traumatic distress in everyday life while you sit in class and you cannot concentrate, while you are so hypersensitive that any touch can distract your 
uh, attention. So that's, that's the meaning of the toll that these children uh, pay for being exposed to chronic or to continuous traumatic stress. So the clinical implications are that there is a need to enhance parental emotion regulation, no doubt. And there are effective uh, interventions for increasing emotion regulation capacity for both parents and children. And as we learn from Tremblay, why not start early? We should start as soon as possible. We sh should start at early childhood. And interventions in with preschoolers and school-age children appear to foster gains in emotion identification and emotion regulation. And I remember what Dr. Waldner Kolk said that one dollar for seven dollars. The best prevention is early and in early childhood. So I just want to mention two interventions that were developed by the Israel Center for the Treatment of Psychotrauma. The first is called Namal, Make Room for Play. This is a Dayadi group program for mother and young children that are practicing together co-regulation in group and everything is done in a playful and fun manner. And uh, this program was developed by Professor Esther Cohen and together with the team of uh, the Israel Center. And we implemented it in many groups in the road with the result. It's published, so those who are interested can read the paper. The second program that I'd like just to mention is the Panda Bear. This is a program for building emotion and affect regulation for school age children. And uh, let me just show you a few photos of the group activity. It addresses regulation in several domains. Uh, physical regulation, emotion regulation, cognitive regulation, behavior regulation, and social regulation. That is, when can I ask help for other, from other and when I can uh, provide help to other. And everything is done in a, in a fun and playful manner. So just an example from uh, practicing mindfulness in the group. It's uh, based on three stages of slow down your body and your thoughts, orient and focus on yourself and the environment, and scan and rate yourself. And then they are doing self-monitoring activity. They uh, rate their relaxation or anger or any other emotion that they are working on on what we call me meter. They just rate how how much do they feel it now and they rate it again after the activity is over and they just can notice the difference or the stability or just be aware of it. They also draw a um, safe place as a physical regulation and practicing physical regulation and all the resources that uh, they uh, accumulate in the group activities are stored in what we call iBox. These are actually treasure chests. It's not shoe box. And they just uh, accumulate it and some of the children are using it for uh, when they are in distress in other, under other circumstances such as uh, if they are hospitalized, they take the treasure chest with the resources to calm themselves down. Just one example from the evaluation, we do, we do mixed method, we do quantitative and qualitative analysis of the effectiveness of the group. I just brought you an example of behavior change that uh, we give them vignette, hypothetical vignette, and they answer to how would they respond to hypothetical vignette. For example, uh, if someone would uh, uh, provoke them, so at first, before the group, a boy said, I would throw a chair and table at the board. And after the group, he did say, I would go out and try to calm myself down. So that's the purpose and, uh, and the satisfaction from uh, the, the program. Just to conclude, um, safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying life also another beautiful quote from uh, Bezer van der Kolk book. Uh, I would like to summarize that there are a lot to do in order to strengthen parents to provide better protection of their children or to coach parents in connection and attunement. 
we need to further explore and evaluate innovative treatment, including biofeedback and mindfulness and meditation and all kinds of sports, in addition to relational psychotherapy, in order to open new paths for recovery and to activate the brain natural neuroplasticity and in regulation capacities. I will conclude with a sentence that was written about the book. The book exposes the tremendous power of our relationship, both to hurt and to heal, and offers new hope for reclaiming lives. Thank you. So we have time for questions for, for Misha Odi Kholishem, you should have a lot. A few questions if anybody wants. Do I even have a microphone to pass around? Um, uh, one second. When I see a two year old and a yeah. mother, often instead of the interactions that you saw in your videos, the nice ones, uh -huh. I think of both of them having a smartphone or a tablet. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that concerns you. Well, it's certainly, uh, 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 Sherry Turkle, who is the person at MIT who writes about this stuff, is freaked out by it. And I'm actually, of course, gravely concerned about kids being raised by iPads. What I'm also really amazed by is that the children who I have in my environments, both uh, all, the, all the parents who I know three generations down, they all don't do smartphones. They all do the iPad pass. We, I live in a very conscious community. It's really, I'm astounded by that actually. So that's sort of my, the people who I, are my framework for the future. Uh, you look puzzled, like that may not be generally true, but actually I'm astounded how the young people I know are very conscious, but these are all of course educated people, uh, people who have interesting parents. Of course in general, being raised by uh, see, the brain is made to interact, and for you to have an action on somebody else and another person have an action on you. I, the research isn't out yet, but having a lot of stimulation where you're not part of the stimulating and the, and the feeding back is unnatural for the brain and of course very worrisome. But I'm also aware, impressed with how many young people I know are aware of that. Hi. Uh, I, I listened to uh, an interview that you gave, uh, I think in 2016, and I, um, you were talking about EMDR and developmental trauma. Uh -huh. and I, was, I was wondering what you think of it now, because you said then uh, you're still waiting for the research to uh, be completed. Well, our, in our research in EMDR, um, people with chronic histories of childhood trauma as a group did not get better and some of them got worse on EMDR. Uh, that doesn't mean that EMDR cannot be a helpful tool, and I certainly use EMDR as one of the many tools for developmental trauma, but developmental trauma is about attachment. It's about feeling safe with people. I don't think EMDR has a lot to offer in terms of the attachment system. It's great for helping you to neutralize traumatic memories, our latest research, uh, where we actually look what happens in the brain when you do that, show that again. But attachment issues do not resolve, get resolved by that stuff. I know people who disagree with that, but they haven't done the research to prove that their religious opinions are correct. Research is important. And when the research shows it didn't work, for now it shows that it didn't work. But, but what we do know is that every therapist should know multiple techniques. If you work with developmental trauma, you need to become very good in many different things. And if you only know one thing, you maybe should charge only a third of your, uh, of your income. <laughs> I, I 
wanted to uh, over yeah. here. Uh, I wanted to ask maybe it's for a whole other uh, lecture but um, if you can say in a few words the impact on uh, of the yoga and the um, uh, martial arts on the brain what happens there that kind of what what about the movement that makes the difference well but but our neuroimaging part of, of uh, yoga showed is that you activate the medial prefrontal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex is that one part of your conscious brain that actually has a direct connection with your limbic system so uh, this is sort of the part where your consciousness is able to say i'm upset right now but remember i'm safe uh, so that uh, what the hindus call the third eye it happens to be the seat of consciousness and that's the one place where you can actually consciously calm yourself down. And yoga, meditation, certainly activates that, that part of the brain very powerfully. What is also intriguing is that yoga activated the insula, and that gets you the whole body thing, because the insula always show up, shows up in all the neuroimaging studies of trauma, particularly developmental trauma. Namely, um, if, you're, if your body is filled with heart-wrenching and gut-wrenching, heartbreaking sensations, you try to push that down. So you get a deactivation of your insula. That means that you feel less in your body. That means you don't get so upset by your heartbreaking, your gut wrench. But your source of pleasure, excitement and motivation is also comes from bodily impulses of this feels good. I'm going to do more of that. So if you shut down or kill that part of your brain, you lose your instinct of purpose, which is very core in PTSD. So as long as, long as you're out of touch with your body, you really are out of touch with life. Very nice Hebrew thing to say, isn't it? L'chaim. Because <laughs> so it's, it's a very important thing that I talked about yesterday quite a bit, is that there's this misconception that trauma is about an event that happened in the past. And the sooner we get away from that, the better it is. That event is over. Just like you're no longer in high school, you're no longer in the military, you're here right now. But, so trauma is the degree to which that particular event has less, left an imprint on your current sensory world. And so, to my mind, all good trauma therapy is done right now because it's alive right now here, and you work with the present state of the body and the mind. Uh, and so this notion you should blast people with the memory of the trauma, so they don't, go, don't get upset anymore, is to my mind a complete misunderstanding about what trauma is all about. I see Pat nods. Not, keep, keep nodding, Pat's really nice, very comforting for me. I was curious yeah. about the video with the child and the neural feedback sample. Yeah. Um, the drastic change between the angry outbursts to a well-behaved child. And I was asking myself, what on earth must have happened to such a child that he acted this way in the first place? And there doesn't seem to be any mention if that was addressed. It seemed that the neural feedback was the single treatment. What about the developmental trauma that got him there? And is there also a piece that addresses that? Well, maybe he didn't have developmental trauma. I'm actually quite friendly with the guy in Melbourne, Marsha Pearl, whose tape that is, and he said, I really don't quite know what happened to the kid. It was not a very normal family, but maybe other people in this room have also experienced that just because you are a thoughtful parent, your kids don't necessarily develop perfectly normally. Uh, most of my friends have, and myself, have kids who have some funny features not because we beat them up because and, and so not everything in life is caused by trauma um, so i don't know if that kid was affected by trauma and to some degree i don't care as a as a neurofeedback person i want you know once you see those brain scans and how messed up they are i want to get that brain to get regulated and once the brain is regulated that person is able to have some language for the internal experience and they may then be able to say oh you know the reason why OAFs got triggered and tried to hit that door down is because way back I saw something that my dad did to me but as long as you're 
Frontalope is just offline and you're just one terrified person, I wouldn't, therapy doesn't work. Because therapy only works once you have a capacity to reflect upon yourself. But as long as you live in the middle of danger, you cannot reflect upon yourself. So the first order of business is actually get a brain, and a forebrain. And yoga is quite nice, getting a forebrain. As are any number of other things. We happen to study yoga. There's probably many other ways of doing it. Yeah. Relating to the children who don't respond to kindness that you spoke about at the beginning, and we meet these children, um, do we know of any way to change, to make a change, to be able to make them to respond to it? Does the more feedback work? Does something else well, work? Well, I'd like to say that if I ever had become head of the National Institute of Mental Health, I would have made the issue of overcoming deficits that were developed because you missed certain critical periods of functioning my first most important priority, actually. But in our neurofeedback with very severely abused kids, we do see them cal calm down and we see them become more relational, absolutely. Um, as, as we see in kids who actually can tolerate doing karate and martial arts uh, and, and uh, sports, they do make them more relational. So there is there's things you can do. But you know, when you hang out with primatologists, and so I'm quite friendly with the successors of Har Harry Harlow, I mean, these brains get damaged. And if you do not get social input, in the criti critical periods of your brain development, it's going to be really hard to read other people's emotions and know your own emotions. These are very hard things. Anybody who thinks this is simple doesn't know what they're talking about. And we like to talk about neuroplasticity, but I like to always say, have you ever been married and tried to change your spouse? Uh, it's not so easy to change people, you know? <laughs> I was wondering, how much of a disturbed childhood does it take to result, uh, <coughs> how much of disturbance in someone's childhood does it take to result in post-traumatic stress disorder? Say it again, sorry. How much of a disturbed childhood yeah. creates post-traumatic well, stress disorder? A disturbed childhood doesn't necessarily lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. It, it leads to externalizing internal behaviors. The things that in the DSM say they brilliantly call oppositional defiant disorder meaning this kid is a pain in the ass, or contact disorder, meaning I can't stand this kid. Huh? So you get behavioral abnormalities. What I mentioned yesterday is that when we created the diagnosis of PTSD, it was very clear from the very beginning that early childhood trauma sets you up to be more vulnerable to develop PTSD in response to later life events. Uh, and so, uh, but it turns out, very, very substantial literature on it now is that the early childhood trauma makes you vulnerable to any number of DSM diagnoses. And that's sort of why I'm trying to get away from the damn DSM because it's such a lousy scientific instrument. Um, and so you get, you get pervasive, you get set up to pervasively be vulnerable to a whole bunch of things like depression, like severe mood dysregulation like some thought disorder probably, sensory in integration. But there's probably where the genetics come in and certain people are more likely to take that path versus that path. So it's not like, okay, you get beaten up and uh, by parents who don't want you. You develop exactly that. And these are not linear things. The head, the mind, and the brain are very complex systems. Uh, so it's not that one thing leads predictably to another thing. But, uh, for example, what Frank Putnam's studies show very clearly, as do Marty Teichers, is that and, and these studies come out all the time as if they're new. Every study that studies a cohort of traumatized kids comes up with these kids develop multiple different somatic and psychological problems that are not easily captured in a very narrow range. But PTSD is one of them. And then once you have this PTSD attitude, you come to blow to the PTSD world. Uh, but, but our PTSD world is about what event happened to you more than about how, how is this person 
organizing their mind and brain around reality and how I can how can I help this person to be uh, to have a mind that's really here and oriented to the present rather than continuing to react as if they're in danger. Is that an answer to your question? I see a lot of questions in your eyes still, no? <laughs> what? The background of trauma in the home? Where? I think path research is, is very interesting in that regard, and I'm very intrigued how you actually diagnose these parents. We actually, we never do that. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's very clear that, uh, and uh, Rachel Yehuda's work also shows that, um, yeah, 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 so I was like, Lord. And, and, uh, But, no, but say, say, but but Rachel Yehuda's work shows, for example, is that if your mother, but not your father, is a Holocaust survivor, you are at greater, greater risk to develop PTSD. And as she looks further into that, and then along the lines of what you find, is that it's not whether you're a Holocaust survivor, but, but if your mom is a Holocaust survivor with PTSD, you are more likely Right, and that's the more emotional regulation. And so, choose your mom carefully and get a nice, <laughs> get a nice mellow mom. So, so but if one typical example, probably very familiar to many of you in this room, if you're a kid and your mom is so reactive that you start crying and your mom gets more upset than you are, a few people in this room had that experience growing up, aside from me. <laughs> that means that that your mom isn't there to, as a so source of comfort, but you need to somehow regulate yourself. And then you start feeling very guilty about feeling anything, so you start inhibiting yourself, less your mom freaks out in response to you. That's what you're going to all spell out for us, I hope, in the future. These are very good questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you very, very much for coming. Um, it's been really, really interesting. I. Uh, Back a couple of years ago, before you did the neurofeedback research, you gave a lecture online um, with a big plea and call to action on the part of the larger mental health community regarding neurofeedback. Um, at that time, I uh, started doing my own research in terms of what was available here in Israel just to see what, what we could get for some of my mm -hmm. clients who really needed it. Um, there was one place at the time, I don't know if that's changed, in Tel Aviv that was doing sort of the standard neurofeedback right. kind of like um, uh, like Seaburn Fisher was doing. Um, uh -huh. and, uh, and then I discovered there's this other thing uh, called Neuroptimal, based on some sort of quantum physics, yeah. a totally yeah. different thing. Yeah. Um, it was much easier to find that available, and so I sent my clients for that. Um, with totally only anecdotal evidence, um, with some really nice success, and I wondered if you had experience with neuroptimal yeah. and what you think of it. Yeah, yeah. I heard about neuroptimal. I heard people who really loved it. Um, that my wife and I had lunch with the people who invented it. i have blown away by how smart they were. Uh, his name is Brown. He lives in Victoria, British Columbia. And then afterwards, we had our own neuro neuroptimal sessions and we both went crazy doing your optimal. So I, an N of two, I sure didn't work for us. <laughs> and basically, so fundamentally, you know, his, his theory is great, he's a very smart guy, I studied with all the right people, but it is one size fits all. You have a formula that you make. Our experience is that it's a little bit like psychotherapy. It's like you may come into my office and I think, I bet EMDR is going to work for this person. And in about a third of the cases, it doesn't work. And we find very much that our neurofeedback protocols need to be highly individualized. And that even our quantitative EEG is not always a good predictor of what the best placement is. Um, I sometimes 
tell Sieber Fisher, who told me in your feedback, I cursed the day I met you. She's a very good friend, I love her. Because it's, you know, it is so hard and there is so little known, it's very hard to get money to do it. There are a lot of very irresponsible neurofeedback practitioners. And yet I think that if we learn how to do it right, it can make a gigantic difference in the world. But boy, is it a work in progress. No, but uh, well, if you don't do it, we had to tear off the air electrodes, both of us individually. We were in separate rooms, and I find myself getting more and more agitated, and I ripped the thing off. And 20 minutes later, my wife comes out of her and says, oh my God, I've never felt so bad in my life. <laughs> like, you know, uh, and and the, so I, I'm not a fan of protocolized stuff, of anything, because you always need to see, is this working for you right now? And the, so the way I was trained to do neurofeedback, and that's how we do it, uh, is we do neurofeedback at every few minutes we say how are you doing and we get a self-report are you feeling sharper are you clearing are you are you sleeping and to continuously adjust our settings according to people's subjective response and i think that interaction is quite quite important just like a psychotherapy uh, in psychotherapy i like to ask people how are we doing was this helpful to you it's sort of a good thing my psychoanalyst never asked me was this helpful to you? It's just a, oh, you two screwed up. <laughs> I was never like, how can I help you? <laughs> I think it's very important for us to say, how can I help you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. It was very interesting. And I'm following all of your work. And in my uh, studies, I'm a certified TRE provider. So we are working with your book, and it's amazing. My question is that if we, if we speak about children and trauma and the correlation between uh, children and their mothers, if we shouldn't first uh, address working with their moms instead of with the children. Great question, great observation. So we do this, neuro, this kid study of like this unspeakably out of control kids with very dedicated parents. And much to my, and these kids can tolerate three minutes of neurofeedback, then they tear it off, and it's a very tough study, and they don't expect very much, but we're, we do a double blind study. And after we open the blind, it turns out that the kids who did get neurofeedback had a tremendous improvement. I didn't expect that. And then we had a parent debriefing evening, and the opening line of the parents was, can we get neurofeedback too? And I said, I know what you're talking about. Insanity is hereditary. You get it from your kids. And if you're living with a completely disorganized kid who does not respond to your affection or to your limits and nothing, you will go crazy. And you'll probably be, are at risk to become fairly abusive because these kids will do very bad things to your capacity to control yourself. So um, I, I don't quite know what the next study will look like and I don't quite know how much money we have but one of my hopes is actually to train the parents and the children and to have a group of parents and children group of kids alone and to compare how and then a group that gets sham control and to see how the three groups uh, match but just like what you say about the control of the parents has a major effect on the kids I think that's very relevant data and I think we should keep that in mind yeah we're going to have it. to stop. Yep. I'm very sorry. It's already late. Um, Guti, thank you so much for coming and discussing. <laughs> Bessel, thank you so much for being here. This That's what happens to you in it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>